Good morning to you. This morning's lesson is titled Full House. It's from Luke 14. This is the parable of the great banquet. You'll recognize that when we get there. In James chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, James says, but he gives more gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. So our theme this year is getting closer, getting closer to God. And that's what I hope we will do through this lesson. Verse 6 of James 4 but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And this is a quote from the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. It's where it comes from. And in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, it says, though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the humble. I want you to think about in Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, he challenges this misguided idea. Some had thought that since God's grace is linked to sin, they could continue sinning to receive more grace. It made sense to them. Paul says, um, no, that's not correct. That's not how we do things. So the truth is that when we are humble, God gives us grace, right? Isn't that what scripture says? At least that's what James says. We just looked at that, but he gives grace to the humble. So just because we sin, does God give us grace? Or is it when we are humble after we sin and we repent? Does it take humility to repent? I believe it does. And so we repent and is God faithful and just to forgive us our sins? Yes, he is. In Christ, that happens. So think about what happened at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Peter delivers a sermon about Jesus to those in Jerusalem, the Jews that were there for Pentecost. And he tells them that they helped crucify the Messiah. Might want to turn me down just a bit. Thank you. And so he tells them they've, they've helped at least to crucify Jesus, the Messiah. And those who felt humble, or you might say those who were humiliated by this thought, by this, this preaching, the thought that I have helped, I had a hand in killing God in flesh. Yes. And so those who felt humbled asked, what should we do? Or men and brethren, what shall we do? How can we get out from under this? It, there's no recall on this, is there? I mean, how in the world do you make things right after you helped crucify Messiah? The one that they've been looking for. Hmm. Well, Repent and be baptized was the answer from God through the Spirit, through the Apostle Peter. Around 3,000 people were humbled and they did just that. God gave grace to the humble that day. Those that in their humiliation of what they had done to Jesus, asking what shall we do? Well, repent and be baptized. They were humble. God gives them grace. And he makes a way out of this, even though they had done horrible things. Same, thing, same thing with us. Even though we sin, there is grace. God gives grace to the humble. Think about Job, the story of Job. Amidst his trials and his unhelpful friends, you remember those guys, Job finds no peace, no answer to why he is suffering. 
And his friends blather on about how he sinned in some way. And, and uh, even though God says, and we read this in, in the book of Job, that God finds no blame in him. Job seeks an audience with God. And in chapter 38, verses 1 through 4, God answers Job, says this. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, who is this who obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. And God goes on for five chapters in his answer. In chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. Then Job replied to the Lord after all of this, after what God said, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this who obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you shall answer me. My ears, my ears had heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job's humility before God wasn't the end of the story. Job 42, 12, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. What's the point? What's the point of all this? If you want God's grace, be humble. Be humble. So we get closer to God with humble hearts. Jesus tries to, to get the message of humility across in various times, at various times during his ministry. And today we look at a parable of Jesus from Luke 14, where Jesus does just that. And I want us to read the text. And as we, as we read the text, keep your eyes and your ears open. Keep your eyes and your ears open for how much God values humility and what he says about it. There's not much he can do with a person that sticks to their arrogance to the end. There's just not much that God can do with that. However, humility opens the door for God's grace or to his grace, you might say. In the words of of Jesus from Luke 14, verse 11. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. So humble followers of Christ are seen through their service to others. Because of Christ's service to them. And God will get all of the judgments right. Don't worry about that. He'll, he'll get it all right. He'll... He'll make sure that every judgment is correct. That's the truth. He knows how to repay. Luke 14, 14. You will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's what Jesus says. In Luke 14, 23. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I love that statement. It's why I gave this lesson the title of full house. It's what God wants. And eventually the Gentiles will be allowed in. Aren't you glad? Because, um, yes, I'm looking at a bunch of Gentiles here, right? Uh, Non-Jewish people. And you can tell me if you are actually a Jew, uh, Jewish by nature afterwards. I would appreciate that. But nonetheless, is God allowing everyone that wants to come in to come in? Yeah, he wants a full house. I absolutely love that idea. love that concept of God. Jesus is not standing in opposition to religious leaders in as much as the religious leaders are in opposition to the grace of God. You know, and the early church had a big problem with Gentiles being allowed in. How can this be? Well, through Jesus, it is. John chapter 1, verse 14. 
in John 1.14, it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. In verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. What came through Jesus being with us? Grace and truth. That's what came through Jesus. So a parable of humility, you might say. This great banquet. Here we are. You thought we'd never get there to read it. I said at the outset we're going to read this, and we will right now. In Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 24, let's take a look at this. Uh, read along silent, silently. That would probably work out best. Right? So, in chapter 14 of Luke, verse 1. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in a house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. Your version may say dropsy. I'm not sure. But that's what that is. And we have a doctor in the house that can tell us afterwards um, more about this, should you want to know. But we continue on. So this man had some kind of abnormal swelling of his body. And that's not good. And so some people have suggested maybe they, they how, I'm thinking, how did this guy get in here? Well, maybe he was invited to test Jesus to see what he would do. Here's this fellow that's suffering. Let's see what he does. They're, they're trying to trap him. They have ill intent. And so he's there. They were watching him carefully. In verse three, Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it, I love this about Jesus. He knows what's going on. He's in tune with their thoughts and, and why he's there. And this man is there that's sick. And so Jesus asked this question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remain silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into the well on a Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they said nothing. We're not going to answer this. We're just going to zip it. Because, the, wait a minute, this is a test for you. We're watching to see what you, don't, don't turn this around on us, right? But it's a great question. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take, uh, take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when the host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. What is Jesus talking about here? Is he talking about the kingdom of God? Is he talking about God's great invitation and how people will, in their arrogance, will say, I, I think I know better. And God's calling them in. Well, Jesus understands what's going on. Verse uh, 10, the end of that. Friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the, all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves, here it is, will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. That's the point of what Jesus is saying. Then Jesus said to his host, the one that invited him, a prominent Pharisee. He says to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers your, or your sisters or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. And so you will be repaid. 
But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table heard him say this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. I can almost hear him saying, how good do we have it? You know, we'll be blessed. Blessed is the one who eats at the feast of the kingdom of God. So Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. First, the first one said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another one said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and on my way, uh, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married and can't be there. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get to taste, will get the taste of my banquet. That's the reading of Luke chapter 14, verses 1 through 24. You know, people seem interested in everything except humility. In spite of what Jesus says, the world, our our culture, even religious people that are unguided by Christ in their arrogance seemingly get their way far too often. Now, you may agree with that statement or not. But Jesus' way is God's way. And we know that God is not guided by culture. God doesn't wait to see what's going to happen in 2024 to see how he's going to do things or what he's going to say. He's already spoken. It's not changing. It's the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He came to show us grace, give us grace and truth. Yes. So we know that God's not guided by culture. In fact, scripture asks this rhetorical question. Um, who is God's counselor? Isaiah chapter 40. Verse 13, who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Who can do that? So in God's kingdom, it is those who serve Christ by serving others who will be lifted up. It's God who exalts. God is the one who exalts. So after looking at this parable, you may say, well, um, who will be in heaven? I've been asked that question before many times. Who's going to heaven? And sometimes it was a gotcha, you know, or I want to get you <laughs> asking of that. Who's going to heaven? Tell me quick, you know. Those who follow and do what Jesus says. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Be arrogant, exalting yourself. And in the end, God will humiliate you by not letting you in. That's the parable that we just looked at. What was Jesus talking about? Just that. And who was he talking to? The Pharisees. The prominent Pharisee that invited him. Yeah. 
So I say, be arrogant, exalting yourself, and in the end, God will humiliate you by not allowing you in. Yes, there is a, a scripture that, that comes to mind. Paul says in Ephesians that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And that's true. I believe that's true. On the day that Christ visits us, there's no way to hide that. And there's no way to say, eh, I'm not believing this. <laughs> I'm going to go for plan B. There is no plan B. Jesus was plan A all along because we sin. And so, who will be in heaven? Well, those who follow Jesus and do what he says. But being arrogant and exalting oneself, and you find even in the end, when Jesus comes, it's undeniable God was right all along. Every knee bow, every tongue confess. Why? Because it's true. Is that unto salvation? At that point, you are either in or you're not. I encourage you to be in this morning. God wants a full house, right? Well, why? Why would God exclude someone who is arrogant, someone who is self-absorbed, exalting themselves, the opposite of being humble, why would he not let them in? Why is Jesus telling this parable? And why not? Why doesn't God just accept everyone? You know, oh, that's a great thought. And I could say, I hope God does accept, just accept everyone. But God has spoken. God's not mean. He loves us. The evil one tries to convince us, did God really say? He's been doing that since um, he talked to Eve. Hmm. Well, why? Why would God not allow those in that were like this? Arrogance, pride, and all that comes with it will not enter in. That is, Sin will not follow us into the presence of God. Aren't you glad? So if I come to God with my sin, unforgiven by Jesus, the blood of Christ, it's not been wiped away. I run the risk, the very big risk of not being allowed in. Why? Because I'm a sinful person. And my sins have not been washed away by the blood of Jesus. So sin will not follow us into the presence of God. And I think everyone here would say, and everyone viewing would say, that's a good thing. Do you want to go to a place where sin just runs the ship? I mean, people are thinking of, of bad things and doing bad things all the time. That's where we are right now, right? We're in the world, but we're not of it. We're headed to a place. And some of our loved ones are there already in the paradise of God awaiting Jesus to return so that we can all be with him forever being with God in his presence. Mm. That's exactly why we follow Jesus. Because he deals effectively with our sin. If we understand what God is giving us through Jesus, these people that he he had been invited to this house and he was there. They couldn't see who he was. We see clearly who he is. And it's exactly why you follow Jesus. Humility leads to repentance, which leads to life. If you're humble, you will repent. If you see Jesus for who he truly is, you will repent. And so, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 7, Peter says, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. That's the way we're to live in the body of Christ. That's the way this church is supposed to function. 
we clothe ourselves with humility toward one another because God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There it is again. It's that Proverbs 334 scripture. It's what James quotes. It's there again. Therefore, Peter says, because of this, because he gives grace to the humble and he's opposed to the proud, because of this, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you at the proper time. Having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Yes, we will be allowed in. Those who are in Christ, those who have clothed themselves in Christ will be allowed in. So may we all get closer to God with humble hearts today and in the days ahead. So unburden yourself today. Um, Peter says, uh, having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Uh, Take the worry out of it. Take the question mark out of living and live for God through Christ. Unburden yourself. Come to Christ today for the forgiveness of your sin. Do you believe in Jesus? Are you willing to repent of your sin? Are you willing to confess his name as Lord of your life? Are you willing to be clothed with Christ in baptism? If so, there'll be a shepherd at the front and he'll greet you and ask you why you've come. And you can let him know. I want in if that's what you want. And we'll take your confession of faith that you believe in Jesus in front of this group. You don't have to be nervous about it. That's all we'll ask you. Well, we'll ask you if you believe and then baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. There's no sweeter deal. You'll never get a better deal than that. It is the best thing that has ever happened to you or to me is to realize what God offers through Jesus. So God wants a full house. Are you in? If so, let it be known this morning as we stand and sing.